great, we can get started. So in the previous lecture, we were talking about likelihood ratio test and we talked about uh, likelihood ratio test with Q sub score. And the idea there is the H naught is X1 to Xn, oh, we used Y, right? Y1 to Yn, yeah. Y1 to Yn are uh, have PDF F naught, HA is Y1 to Yn has PDF F1 and the test was F1, F1 yt over F0 yt and then z was max 1 less than k less than equal to n minus 1 s k to n. I think I have copied everything correctly and the rejection region was tau infinity. I should write it as Zn. <coughs> the cool thing about this particular algorithm was two things. First, I can write Zn as max of 0, Zn minus 1 plus log of F1 yn over f0 yn or maybe I should write t with respect to t. Y t minus 1 and z0 is equal to 0. So I can compute this uh, zt recursively using this particular expression and then as soon as zt exceeds the threshold tau, I am going to raise an alarm and say that okay things have, things are not the same. Uh, we were starting with F0 and now we are seeing random variables which are uh, of the form F1. So that's our uh, likelihood ratio based test. This is what we studied in the previous class. Now what is the drawback of this particular algorithm? So I understand that this algorithm can take data sequentially, update the ZT and can raise an alarm if at all ZT exceeds the threshold tau. What's the drawback here? We had discussed one specific drawback of this algorithm in the previous class. Can you remind me what the drawback is? So the cool thing here is you can do it sequentially. The drawback is you need to know what F1 is. You need to know, so you need to know the distribution of your random variables. Uh, these are all IID. So you need to know the distribution of random variables um, under, uh, under no attack, but you also need to know the distribution of the random variable under the attack. And one of the things we had discussed is, generally what you would do is you will call someone who's called penetration tester and then they are going to cause the attack and then you will figure out what the F1 is going to look like, right? So, uh, 
So it requires an expensive affair. You need to hire someone, they'll come, they'll spend some time testing it. They'll tell you what F1 looks like after the attack. And then you can design your algorithm for, uh, for coming up with attack detection. Um, ideally, we would like to be able to test the hypothesis even when we do not know what F1 is. Okay? So how do we do that? So the drawback is I need to know what F1 is. Now I want to come up with a new hypothesis testing where I know F0 but F1 but F1 is unknown. What do we do in that particular situation? If we do not know F1, then what do we do? How do we run this test? So it turns out, so F0 is known. F0 is completely known. So this is known as a change detection with unknown post-change distribution. So the change has happened, which means that the attack has started, but the distribution F1 is unknown, unknown post-change distribution. So the idea here is uh, borrowed from the likelihood ratio test that we talked about yesterday. What we are going to do is, uh, we'll try to figure out what is the best theta that explains this observation and then we will come up with this test according to that theta. So the way to define your SK to N in this case is where should I write it? I should write, I'll probably write it here. SK to N is summation T equals K to N. Wait. So you define what theta A looks like, what, what are the, what is the set of potential attacks? And then you define T equals K to N. log of F1 yt theta over log of F0 theta. No, 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 no. There is no log in the denominator. F0 yt, yeah. And then you can define your Zn exactly in this fashion. And now the drawback has come back again. So this one is not sequential. You cannot compute it sequentially. You cannot compute SK to N sequentially because you have to do this supremum operation at every point of time. So the assumption here is F1 unknown but we know theta A. So theta under attack, we know what the theta under attack looks like, in which case we can compute this supremum, but then the problem is that supremum cannot be computed sequentially, so we lose the sequential nature of the attack detection. Is everything clear so far?
So if you were the if you were in a position where you have this kind of a uh, problem, what would you do? How would you solve this problem? So you have S k to n. Okay, so let's say n is one thousand, right? So you have for all k between one and nine hundred and ninety nine. you need to solve this supremum of this particular summation uh so this is an objective function you need to solve a maximization problem 999 times okay before you can raise an alarm does that make sense right so for each k i need to compute this sum and i need to optimize figure out what the best theta is and i need to do this 999 times what would you do to reduce the computational burden here so the way to reduce the computational burden is i am going to define my zn as max of n minus W less than equal to k less than equal to n minus one s k to n. So this is known as a window-based attack detection. This is a window. I'm looking at a window, and I only have to solve W optimization problems. So I'm fixed. I have fixed my uh, number of. Uh, number of optimizations that i have to do that is fixed upper bounded by w i only have to solve w optimization problems and then i can compute the max and then i can raise an alarm if zn is above a threshold and the problem is you lose some efficiency you are you are removing a lot of data in your uh, window based approach so therefore it is not very uh, very beneficial but uh, that's pretty much the only thing you can do to reduce the computational burden for this particular algorithm so based on this approach i think there is something which could be more elegant approach is if i do not make any assumption about f0 and f1 wouldn't that be amazing if i could define the hypothesis test along the lines of y1 to yn are unattacked or and the alternate is y1 to yn looks attacked okay that would be really cool if i could say that so it's completely data driven i don't need to know what f0 is i don't need to know what f1 is in fact i don't even need to know if it has a pdf or it doesn't have a pdf okay it doesn't need to have a pdf in that case so today we are going to talk about mmd based q sum statistic So what are we given here in this particular test I have a reference data set x1 to xn This is unattacked So you can think of it as a clean data set it's a clean data set it is unattacked nobody attacked this uh, at that at the point of collecting this particular data set uh, nobody had attacked these are all iid according to some distribution my h not is i am observing y1 to yn ym this is I need to give the distribution a symbol. Can I use mu as a symbol? 
So mu is uh, the distribution of x1 to xn which, when it is unattacked. Let me write it as mu naught and then mu a would be like the attacked one. So y1 to ym is distributed according to mu naught, h a is y1 to y m not distributed according to mu naught. Mu naught is unknown. How would you solve this problem? It's some distribution. I don't know if it is discrete. I don't know if it is continuous. I don't know if it has a PDF. I don't know if it has a PMF. It's some distribution, mu naught, which is unknown. I have a reference data set. I have the today's data set. So this is y1 to ym. This is today's data set. And I want to know if the data set that I'm getting today has the same distribution as the reference data set or it doesn't have the same distribution as the reference data set. So for instance, you know, like to yesterday, I know that the building was not attacked. So I have the temperature readings of the building from yesterday. So that's my reference data set. Now today, I have been measuring the temperature since morning. And I want to know if the temperature I'm seeing today has the same statistic as the reference data set or it doesn't have the same statistic as the reference data set? That's my question. How would you know if today's temperature readings that you are seeing has the same distribution as yesterday's temperature reading? What would you do in this particular situation? You don't know what the distribution is. How would you solve this problem? Yeah, okay. So you would want to do density estimation and then? Then you can compute some kind of distance metric from the new data point to the... Awesome, awesome, yeah. That's exactly what we are doing here, right? So we are doing the density estimation by taking the supremum of log likelihood. Then we are taking the ratio and this leads to the distance measure which is a KL divergence, okay? I don't know how many of you know KL divergence. I have not talked about it in this class, so I'm not telling you what exactly that converges to, but basically it converges to the KL divergence. The summation would converge to the KL divergence between F0 and F1. Okay, so yes, one option is I can go through the likelihood ratio test type of thing where I do the maximum over theta naught in the numerator, max over theta A in the denominator, and now the problem is I don't even know what the numerator uh, distribution looks like, so I'll have to do something. Uh, I'll have to estimate the density using x1 to xn, and then I'll have to evaluate it at y1 to ym, and then I'll have to do the ratio test. And yeah, that's a possible way. And what we are, what you are alluding to, is generalized likelihood ratio test with density estimation. So yeah, that's some one way to do it. Any any other idea? Any other idea? So that's, uh, that particular uh, approach of uh, doing it is a bit uh, complex because there is a lot of estimation. Whenever you do estimation, the problem is uh, you will introduce estimation errors and then you do the log of erroneous F0 and the log of erroneous F0 in the denominator and that's going to create a lot of errors that then propagates because then you are summing it up from k to n. So now you are propagating a lot of errors. So that's why that particular test is a bit problematic because you're introducing a lot of errors and then you are adding it up. So you can't really test whether it's going to work very well or not with finite number of samples. It'll work absolutely best 
it'll, it'll work very, very well if you have infinite samples. This, M, this N was like a trillion, trillion, trillion. And this M was billion, billion, billion. Then it's going to work very well. But we don't have time for billions and trillions of data points. We have limited amount of time. So there is a, let me call this distribution as mu A. So this is the attack distribution. This is the distribution under attack. If the temperature of this building was under attack, then the distribution is mu A. And it's not the same as the temperature of the building under no attack scenario. OK. So there is a metric, distance metric, called MMD between mu naught and mu A. MMD square, MMD square. Now the problem is I don't know what mu naught and mu a is, so I need to compute it using only the samples. So I need to, well, So instead of trying to estimate the density and then estimate the distance between the two density, I'm just going to compute the distance itself. And it turns out that this distance metric MMD square that I'm going to introduce now, uh, you can actually compute it without actually knowing what the, what the distance is. Uh, uh, sorry, without uh, knowing the density function. So let's talk about MMD. So there is something called a reproducing kernel Hilbert space, which I don't want to discuss today. But one of the core ideas of reproducing kernel Hilbert space is something called a kernel K that maps X cross X to I think R. And the property is K X I X J create a matrix. Am I using capital M yet? No, I'm not using capital M, right? Okay. So I'm creating a matrix of k, x, i, x, j. So M2 would be k, x1, x1, k, x1, x2, k, x2, x1, k, x2, x2. So I pick any two points, x1 and x2 within the set capital X, I create this uh, matrix out of this kernel function K, and this matrix has to be positive definite for every N, and for every Xi, Xj pair. Xn in capital X. Am 
I want this matrix to be positive definite. Okay, does that make sense? So let's, uh, so I pick arbitrary sequence of x1 to xn, I construct this matrix M, Mn, and that Mn must be positive definite. Of course, all of these x1 to xn are distinct. They're not the, you cannot just pick x, 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 x all the way to n, because otherwise this is a constant matrix and then it's not positive definite. So there has to be variations in x, but as long as you pick all of these uh, values that are distinct, and then you construct this matrix, then you get a positive definite matrix. What does positive definite mean? It means that it also symmetric and all the eigenvalues are strictly greater than zero. So it has to be a symmetric matrix as, as well. So let's try to find what the different kernel functions are which satisfies this condition. So, examples, so X is a subset of Rn, Kx, Y equals to X transpose Y. x is equal to is a subset of Rn and k x y equals to alpha x transpose y plus 1 raised to d alpha greater than 0 d is in n. So this is the inner product, this is polynomial. You can take any P norm. So X could be Rn or X could be anything. X needs to have a norm. So X could be Rn, X could be 0, 1 raised to N. Um, as long as you can define a distance metric, you can use whatever distance metric you have. So let me remove the P norm because you could be outside of Rn. So whatever norm you have, you can use that norm here and you get what is known as a Gaussian kernel and the Laplacian kernel. So this is Gaussian. This is Laplacian. Any questions so far? So we have discussed a lot of different kernels here. All of these kernels satisfy this property that Mn is positive definite for every N and for every distinct 
x1 to xn. Uh, this is known as the inner product, kernel based on inner product. This is the polynomial kernel. This is the Gaussian kernel. This is the Laplacian kernel. There's another way to do it. Uh, you can construct kernel k of x, y equals to, oh, wait, I'll give you one more example. So I need, I have four. four fourth example is x is a discrete set. And then k of x, y is 1 if x equals to y, 0 otherwise. It's just an indicator function. If x is equal to y, then you get set the kernel value to be equal to 1. If x is not equal to y, then you set it equal to 0. And then you can construct new kernels, summation of alpha i k i x y i equals 1 to n. Well, I'm using n again. I've used n, I've used m, I can use l. L, alpha is strictly positive. I'll pause here for questions. I'll pause for a few minutes. So as to take questions. Any questions? No? Awesome. So let's look at an example, a specific example that we used uh, very recently of this particular kind of change detection. So my x was so this is an example from my own life, from my own research. So I just want to give you an example of how we use this kind of, we construct this kind of kernel function. So we were looking at a space x, it's a discrete space, 0, 1 raised to 256. So I have 256 bits, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, those are 256 bits. And we needed to construct a kernel function for exactly this kind of problem. What was the problem? The problem was to authenticate what is known as a physically unclonable function. So physically unclonable functions are small chips. Um, those devices are, uh, it has a very highly nonlinear sort of output and then they saturate the output in order to get the bits out. So they get like zero, they ha there is an input Based on the input, you get an output, which is, the input is also of this size, and the output is also exactly of this size. And the, the way those chips are used is the input-output behavior is very unique to that particular chip. So if you have like 250 chips of that type, each of them will have its distinct signature. And that signature needs to be used for authentication. So the idea is those chips will actually sit in every EV charger, and every electric vehicle and every device that needs to be authenticated on a network. And then the input will be sent to that particular device and the output will come out and then we will authenticate 
And the way we will authenticate is I'm going to give it M input, I'm going to get M output, and I'm going to authenticate if it is the same chip that was supposed to be there, or it's a different chip that was, that has been uh, tampered with, okay? So that was the reason why we were studying this problem in the context of uh, authenticating systems, okay? Uh, how would you construct a kernel for this kind of space? So what's the a, what's a natural distance on this space? What's the distance that you can put on 0, 1 raised to 256? So we basically did summation i equals 1 to 256, the indicator function of xi not equal to yi. That's a valid distance function. So this indicator function is equal to 1 if this condition is true. It is equal to 0 otherwise. So if this condition is not true, if xi is equal to yi, then this value is going to be 0. This is known as an indicator function. Do you all see why this is a valid distance metric? So if x is not equal to y, then this is non-zero. If x is equal to y, then this is equal to zero. It's a metric, and it also satisfies the triangle inequality. Okay. So the way we constructed the kernel function is one over seven exponential d x y over 2 i think maybe maybe 1 square no just 1 and then 1 over 7 e x p d x y over 2 2 then plus 1 over 7 e x p d x, y over 4, and so on. Over 64. 2 raised to 0, 2 raised to 1, 2 raised to 2, all the way up to 2 raised to 6. And we didn't stop there. We added You don't need to note it down. We basically added the Laplacian kernel with different values of R, and then we added Gaussian kernel with different values of, of R in the denominator. Okay, so seven Laplacian kernel and seven Gaussian kernel. We added them all up in order to get this kernel function. This is just an example of how we construct new kernels from old kernels, as long as each of these alpha is strictly positive. So we picked equal weight because that seemed to work well for our application, but you can change the weights depending on your own application. For us, it kind of did the job we wanted it to do. Okay. So it's clear what, how you construct the kernel function and how you use it in practice. So that's how we did it. Any questions so far without, before I erase this stuff? Yes. Uh, does the choice of D matter, like I can construct a vector, right? Or one as long as it follows all the, all the properties of a norm, you can use it uh, or a metric. Right, I mean the Euclidean distance is same as this distance in this case. Uh, but yeah, if you consider Euclidean distance, that's also completely fine. 
See, the issue is you can use any P norm because all of those are valid norms. Uh, whether it works well for your, for your specific application or not is something you will have to test. It's not something that you can know upfront that, okay, Laplacian kernel will work well. So because we didn't want to find out what the best kernel was, we just added up all the kernels. And so if, if this was the best kernel, we will still be able to detect the change, right? So because all of these kernels are going to add up and any changes uh, with respect to any of the kernels will get detected at the time of test statistic level. Any other question? Awesome. So let's talk about MMD, maximum mean discrepancy. So we now know how to construct kernels. We have seen some examples of the kernels. So MMD square of mu naught and mu A is given by, there it is. Oh, uh, it's not exact, it is, approx I'm going to approximate it. 1 over m n n minus 1 summation i summation j not equal to i k x i x j plus 1 over m Uh, I have used mu a. Okay, let me let me use it mu x and mu y because uh, I have the reference data set x and I have these samples y. So I don't know what what distribution y has. It could be mu naught. It could be mu a. So I'm just using mu y to denote the distribution of y. Okay, so this is known as a maximum mean discrepancy. Let me write it down. Maximum mean discrepancy. Maximum mean discrepancy. That's the name of this metric. Uh, it's not something you would study in any of the probability or statistics class. It's kind of a new thing in the market. It's a new kid in the block kind of thing. Uh, people have been focusing on MMD for the last 15 or so years. Uh, so it's something that's there in research papers but not necessarily in textbooks yet. I mean, maybe there are some textbook that considers it, but generally, if you look at general textbooks, you won't find much mention of maximum mean discrepancy. So this is how you compute the maximum mean discrepancy. 
It's an approximation, so I want to make sure that you understand this is an approximation, because you only have samples, you don't have the true, true uh, distributions. And the theory is very complicated, it requires quite a bit of mathematical sophistication to understand how to go from here to here. It might require several classes of work to show you. So that's why I've just written it that this is an approximation when n and m are sufficiently large. Okay, by sufficiently large, what I mean is, uh, in the example that I was talking about, the, uh, the example about uh, the physically unclonable function, the n and m were of the order of five or 10. Okay, so not too, too, not too high. Uh, but it was a 128 dimension, 256 dimensional object. So you don't really need a lot of samples here, but, but ideally you want sufficient number of samples. You want 20, 30, 40, 100, depending on the application that you are considering. So as long as M and N are sufficiently large, this is a good approximation of the MMD. Awesome. What is the rejection region here? When will you reject? So remember H0, so look at H0. H0 says this distribution and this distribution is the same. HA says this distribution and this distribution are different, right? So what should the rejection region be? When should we reject H0? We should reject H0 when this is my Zn or Z M comma N, and the rejection region is tau should be tau and infinity. So if, if you compute this value, MMD square, uh, and it turns out to be greater than a threshold tau, then it means that the distribution of X and the distribution of Y are completely different. I mean, not completely, but they are different. That's why this uh, empirical MMD is turning out to be greater than tau. This is my empirical MMD. So empirical MMD is turning out to be greater than tau. If empirical MMD is less than tau, then it means that mu naught, the distribution of x1 to xn and the distribution of y1 to ym is close to each other and therefore they are the same distribution. Can you compute this sequentially? As you are getting data, so you have x1 to xn in your data set, and you are observing ym, and then you will observe ym plus one, then you will observe ym plus two. Can you compute this sequentially? So what happens when I go from ym to ym plus one? So here I will have m plus one and then m. And here I will have the entire sum from the previous time step. And then I will have to add k of yi, ym to this particular mix. And the same thing I'll have to, xi is already there. So this part is computed at night with yesterday's data. This part is something that I'm computing as time progresses. This part is something that, something that I'm computing as time progresses. So remember, J goes from one to M. So if I go to M, if I go from M to M plus one, I have to compute this sum again. For all XI, I'll have to compute this kernel, and then I have to change this M to M plus one. So this is also something you can compute sequentially. As new data arrives, you can keep adding more and more stuff to this summation, and you change these coefficients here and then you get your MMD square with new information. So this also allows you to compute MMD sequentially as new data arrives. However, there is one problem with this test, and the problem is you want your N and M to grow similarly. So you can't have N to be like five, and M to be like 1,000, okay? Then it becomes a problem. You can't have N to be 1,000, and M to be five. So you want N and M to have similar order, like maybe like 500 and 300 is fine, but it can't be like 1002 or 1003. 
So M and N should grow in a similar fashion. So that's another thing that you need to know about this uh, empirical estimate of MMD. Now what I'm going to do in the next class, uh, we haven't talked about the QSUM statistic. Let me see if I can introduce it right away. No, I think it's going to take some time. Uh, so I'm going to build on this. I'm going to build on this empirical estimate of MMD. I'm going to build on it in the next class and come up with a QSUM statistic. This is not a QSUM statistic, by the way, because it does, it's not in the form of SK2N and all that stuff. So in the next class, I'm going to build upon this knowledge of computing empirical MMD, uh, come up with a QSUM statistic, and then we'll have a QSUM based MMD, uh, MMD based QSUM statistic, uh, and then we will do the hypothesis testing based on that. So that's our uh, goal for the next class. Any questions so far? Okay, and then we will, uh, we will, uh, uh, we'll talk about the Markov chain version, the dynamical system version of this. And the dynamical system version of this is actually, uh, the algorithm we'll talk about in the class is actually developed by my PhD student who's still around. So he's still, he hasn't yet finished his PhD, but he's the one who came up with that algorithm. So we'll talk about that as well in the next, class, next, uh, next week. So this week we'll focus on this one in the next class, that's on Friday, and then next week we'll talk about Markov chain and, uh, and detection for Markov kernels. So thank you.